Welcome to the Thick and Mystic Moment, the show that's all about uncovering the secrets of personal transformation and celebrating the incredible stories of those who've dared to change their lives. I'm your guide, Robert John Hadfield, and together we'll explore the power of change. Let's get started. In 1947, a young woman named Phyllis moved from her home in Arizona to San Francisco, California with a secret. You see, Phyllis was a student at the University of Arizona in Tucson, and she had become pregnant. And her plan was to move to San Francisco, go through the pregnancy, eventually have the baby, give the baby up for adoption, and then go back to college and nobody would know anything about it. And her plan worked. She moved to San Francisco where she had a baby boy on October 16th, 1947. And this baby was uh, immediately taken in, put up for adoption and taken by Fred and Eleanor Weir. And then Phyllis went back to school and nobody knew anything about it. So this young boy, the name they gave him was Robert, and they raised him in Atherton, California. And they had big plans for him. The family that he was given to was a pretty, pretty well-off family, highly educated, and they had anticipated that he'd grow up, he'd do great in school, and then, of course, then he'd go to a really prestigious university and make them proud. <laughs> well... Young Robert, although he actually, it turns out, was kind of above average intelligence, had dyslexia problems and other learning issues that made school not really his thing. And he was, he was very challenged by it. But he found out that he really loved music. And he tried playing the trumpet. He tried playing the piano. Not, neither one of those really clicked. And then he bought a guitar. And for some reason, the guitar just spoke to him. As a matter of fact, when he was 15 years old, he went off and during the summer apparently worked at a ranch. And he says at nighttime at the ranch, all the, all the cowboys there, there was none of the modern things we have today to keep you occupied. And so you'd sit up late at night playing the guitar, singing and telling stories. And so this kind of became part of him. And so he, he, he became a, you know, he, he became a guitar player, really loved that. And then the story of his music took a really interesting turn on New Year's Eve of 1963. He was 16 years old at the time. And he and a buddy were walking around town looking for something to do. It was New Year's Eve and they heard some music coming from a little music shop and they walked inside and found this 21 year old guy playing the banjo uh, guy's name's jerry and they sat and talked with each other for a while and and uh, started just hanging out that evening new year's eve and then finally jerry said any guys know how to play any instruments turns out of course bob knew how to play uh, knew how to play the guitar and so they busted out some instruments and they spent, the, they spent the evening just jamming and playing music together. Well, it went so well and they had so much fun together that, that Bob and Jerry uh, decided that they should put a band together. And they created a group that they called Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Champions. <laughs> I love that name. Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Champions. And they were a jug band, kind of an old-fashioned jug band. These guys were influenced by bluegrass and the blues and country music. And, and they just they had this fun little thing. And they actually did kind of well for themselves. And, it, it, and they actually started making money, and, and the band started doing something. Well, it was sometime in the next year or so when the Beatles hit. And here young Bob and Jerry, 
they were they they see this stuff come in this band that comes in and they see that this would have been you know in the 1964 19, 1965 range and they're playing electric guitars and so these guys thought you know what that's what we should be doing so they kind of hung up their folk music and their jug band aspirations <laughs> and they got some electric instruments and they started turning this more into an electric band and they needed to change their name from the from Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Champions, obviously. And so they changed the name to be better match what they were doing at that point, And they called themselves the Warlocks. Now, problem was, they found out a year or so later that there was already a band called the Warlocks. And so they had to change their name. And so one night... Uh, a couple of the guys in this new band, the Warlocks, were together. Jerry and, and Phil were, were at Phil's place, and Jerry opens up a dictionary, and he sees this term that would become the name of their band and would become synonymous with, in some ways, the attitude of the 1960s. Because the name that Jerry found in the dictionary that day was the name the grateful dead and of course the jerry we're talking about is that that bob met on new year's eve in 1963 was jerry garcia in a music shop playing the banjo and it just so happened bob weir and of course that was his last name his parents were were uh fred and eleanor weir of course robert weir uh, is Bob Weir, who we all know from, if, if you follow this stuff, you'd know him from the Grateful Dead. And Phil Lesh, of course, was the, was the apartment they were at when Jerry looked into the dictionary and found the name the Grateful Dead. So the Grateful Dead then, even if you don't know anything about music and you don't even know anything about their music, you have definitely heard the name The Grateful Dead before. That, that again, has become kind of synonymous with that era, with that decade especially. And, of course, now this young Robert Weir, or Bob Weir, as everybody knows him today, uh, who had had trouble in school and <laughs> went off and started playing this music, ended up going out and having a massive impact on, well, on Western culture. Because there's never been, I don't know, they, they set the stage for so many other groups that would come after them and do similar things to what they did. And, but the, the Bob Weir story doesn't end there. The, the band, of course, went on to change change the world in so many different ways and i i remember the uh, living in denver colorado every single year it seems like the grateful dead would come through and everybody knew when they were coming through because morrison colorado which is where red rocks r is located roughly would just fill up with deadheads and it would just like the whole the whole atmosphere of Denver change at that point because of what was going on there. And, and they would fill up, they'd sell out. It seems like every single year they'd sell out three nights at Red Rocks and they just toured the world constantly. And they just, they, it seems like they never really waned. They just got bigger and bigger. And this is one of the things that is so fascinating about the rise of the Grateful Dead and how they had this staying power, and and it can be attributed to a bunch of other bunch of things probably. But one of the things that that I find so fascinating was that these guys, whether on purpose or on accident, discovered the power of social media decades before the term even existed. You see, what would happen? When these guys, when the Grateful Dead would play their shows, very early on, people would show up with little recorders and they would record the, they'd record the concert. Now, you've probably been to concerts before. If you ever went to a concert where you had a printed ticket, 
Matter of fact, you even see this stuff today when you get your electronic tickets. It'll say something like, no photography or recording device is allowed. And, and I, I remember actually going to concerts in the 80s and I had a buddy that had a really nice camera and he'd manage this stuff it into his pants in such a way that nobody could see it and then he'd kind of sneak it out in the show and he'd take pictures and, and every once in a while somebody would sneak a little tape recorder in or something but boy that was a no-no in concerts <clears throat> and so similarly when people started doing this at Grateful Dead concerts early on the record company says no we're going to put an end to this you can't allow people to come in here and record your shows because then they're not going to buy your records and they're not going to come to your concerts. Well, Bob, Bob Weir, <laughs> the guys in the Grateful Dead said, you want them, to, you want to stop them from bringing the stuff in? You stop them. Because we don't want to be the police at our own shows. And then basically nobody stopped them. And then this amazing thing happened. People would record concert after concert after concert, and then they would start sharing the recordings of Grateful Dead shows. I've actually, I know people. I've met people that have these just boxes of hundreds and hundreds of cassette tapes that they've, they've uh, shared over the years that other people recorded or things that they recorded. And then what happened is people would record these shows and then they start sharing them with each other. And then what would, then this idea where we understand it today as social media actually started happening. People would record a show in one town and they'd start sharing it with other people. They'd take it from town to town and people would say, oh, you have the one from such and such a date and they'd want to get a copy of that one. And since every show they did was kind of a little bit different, these, these tapes would get spread all over the place. People would take pride in these, these collections they had of Grateful Dead concerts, recordings, and guess what? At least, you, you, so you got to ask yourself now, did that have an impact on their career? Did it stop people from buying their records? Did it stop people from going to their concerts? You would have a hard time arguing that it had a negative impact on their careers. Because even today, I mean, even in the last few years, there's still bands that are kind of spinoff groups and, and different people in the band still touring and putting little things together that, that there's still a demand. People still go see anything related to Grateful Dead. It's hard to argue that it had any sort of an impact on their career at all. And as a matter of fact, you could argue the opposite, that in some ways that 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 thing that was almost like social media, people sharing the concerts and sharing the recordings ended up having a positive impact. It created new fans. It, 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 fans became almost like an army of people out there promoting the Grateful Dead for them. And it seems that over the years, not only did their fame not wane, it got bigger and bigger and bigger, which, which is amazing because these guys never really had any sort of a hit up until, I think it was 87 when, what was the song called? A Touch of Grey? It was actually a great tune. I think it was the first time they ever had a song that was in the top 10. Anyway, so it's hard to argue that that had any sort of an impact on their career. And what's amazing then is that when something like Napster showed up, that the whole record company, instead of, instead of learning from things like the Grateful Dead and their successes and letting people just share their music, they started fighting it. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I'm not in the business really, and, and I don't know, but, but I just, I look back at that and I think, shouldn't we learn something? The fact that these guys got bigger and bigger and bigger, they went against conventional wisdom that says if people record your concerts and if people start giving away those recordings, it's going to ruin your career. And, and when you listen to Bob Weir talk about it, he says, didn't seem to have any impact on, on us. And he, he has also said, you know, people give us credit for being these really brilliant businessmen by allowing that to happen. And he says, all we were doing was just trying to avoid 
conflict. We just, we just kind of followed the easy way. And then what they did is by the time the 80s showed up and recording equipment was getting more and more higher quality equipment, people were showing up with these big 10-foot stands with microphones and whatever to record the concerts. And then what started happening is in the audience members would say, start complaining because the things were blocking their view. And so then the Grateful Dead just started thinking, well, if people are going to be recording our concerts, we may as well let them do it in as good a quality as possible. So they actually designated a section near the mixing board where you can have your best sound where people could just go set up whatever they wanted to set up, big microphones, big stands, and get the best possible recordings they could. Amazing. Well, anyway, I told you that the, the Bob Weir story didn't end with, uh, there was more to it than, than what I had already shared with you. In 1971, now, just, several, just a few years after the Grateful Dead came into existence and had already begun really gaining worldwide fame, Bob Weir's adopted, adoptive parents both died within about three weeks of each other. His adoptive mother died on his father's birthday. And then a few weeks later, his father died on his mother's birthday. Now, as part of the adoption agreement, uh, the birth mother, Phyllis, had agreed to not make contact with Bob until after both parents had passed away. They passed away, as I said there, in 1971. She waited about 10 years. And then a phone call came to the Grateful Dead office in 1981 from a woman looking to talk to, to Bob Weir and said that her name was Phyllis and she used the last name that was on Bob's birth certificate, something that only she would know. And he uh, basically, he, she, uh, he took the call and visited with her and found out that she had gone on to have 12 more children. <laughs> and, and that what had happened is that she and a young man had had a fling while she was at the University of Arizona. She, again, as we said earlier, moved to San Francisco where she gave birth to him, put him up for adoption, and then went back to school and really never spoke of it again. But she had been following him and following his career and knew all about the stuff that he'd been doing. In the background, watching as her birth son had, uh, had been having this incredible career and all of his success. He was the only child that was put up for adoption because he was the accident. She went on and, and then just had a family. And she also told him about a guy named Jack Parber. Jack was his birth father who he came to find out knew nothing about any of this. So Bob got a private investigator on this to see if he could track down Jack. And apparently within minutes, this uh, investigator was able to find him. Turns out he was a serving as a commanding officer at the Air Force Base, just a few miles away from where Bob lived. Armed with this information, Bob didn't do anything. He just sat on it. And he sat on it for about a decade until he finally decided, you know what, this guy is not getting any younger. I need to 
I, I should try to get a hold of him. And he figured that this was, this was going to be come out of the blue. He thought, am I going to write him a letter? Should I just drop by? <laughs> hey, you know, and, and introduce myself or, and he finally decided, you know, I'm just going to get, I'm going to get on the phone and I'm going to give him a call. And he says, I figure I got 15 to 20 seconds before the guy hangs up the phone. So I need to make this good. <laughs> so, so he calls up Jack and he said, he said, is this, you know, Jack Barber? And yeah. And he says, uh, I have been, and he, he was, it's very interesting because he was very, very, had this very formal approach to him. And he says, I've been doing some research and I have some information that might be of interest to you about things that transpired 50 years ago in Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> and then he said there was just silence on the other side of the phone. And then he proceeded to ask him, did you have a romantic relationship with a uh, young woman named Phyllis? And then he said, yes and silence. And then he said, he said, well, my name is uh, Bob Weir and I don't know how many children you have, but there is a really good chance that you have one more child than you realize. Again, there was silence. And then he came back with uh, well, the only Bob Weir that I know anything about is a guy that sings for the band The Grateful Dead. At which Bob responded, well, that's me. <clears throat> they met for lunch the next day. And after kind of sizing each other up for a few minutes, they absolutely hit it off. And inside of that lunch became really close friends. And they actually started visiting each other on a regular basis. At one point, uh, Bob finds out that he has several other siblings now because Jack had gotten married and had some kids. And as a matter of fact, one of his kids had gone on to also play music and had done okay for himself and had a bunch of guitars and, and had unfortunately though, sometime before Bob came back into the picture or came into the picture had died from spinal cancer and the other kids in the family had had his guitars and had taken his guitars, but there was this one guitar that nobody wanted. And it was an old Fender Telecaster that was kind of beat up and it wasn't in very good shape. And, and one day when Bob was visiting his uh, father, who was now living in Nevada, he came upon this old Fender Telecaster and said, would you, uh, would you mind if I just took this thing and I'll take it to my guitar tech and see if we can get this thing back up and running. And so Bob took that guitar um, and they got this old Telecaster cleaned up, wired up and running great. And then Bob started playing that Telecaster and for Many, many years after that on tour, he took his half-brother's Telecaster, a young man that he never met, and took that guitar and played it live and toured the world playing that instrument. On April 10th of 2015, Jack Parber passed away and he and Bob had been close till the day, till the day he was gone. 
It's such an interesting thing looking at a person's life like this. And of course, the one of the things that jumped out at me, and I already talked about this, was that whole going against conventional wisdom. Don't allow people to record your shows because... Because people aren't gonna, people aren't gonna buy your records. People aren't gonna, people aren't gonna come to your concerts, and they just defied it, and probably in some ways ended up working out better for them. But the other thing is following that banjo. Walking around that New Year's Eve and hearing that banjo music. Hearing that thing that invites you in. Hearing that thing that really you have sensed is your mission in life. You follow that sound. And that sound leads you to meet Jerry Garcia. And together you go out and you change the world together. And as I talk every single day about these moments in your life when things change, sometimes that's what it is. It's you hear the sound. You hear the thing that speaks to you. And when you can find the thing that is your passion, that you're also really talented at, that is when massive change can happen in your life. Thank you for joining us on another Thick and Mystic Moment. We hope today's episode has sparked your curiosity and ignited the flames of change within you. Remember, you're not alone on this journey. Stay connected with the Thick and Mystic Moment on all major social media platforms. Please come and share your thoughts with us and share the podcast with your friends and anyone else seeking transformation in their life. This is Robert John Hadfield signing off. And remember, do something different today. <laughs>